So, I said some time ago I'd do a part two on the walking base stuff. So here we go. So here's something that is like really important and people don't talk about this enough. I'm gonna do like a, 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 a series of walking stuff to actually be purchased off my website, but I'll give you a couple of pointers because it's cool things to get into. So one of the things is think about sound, you know, and a lot of the time when people play walking lines, they often play really short staccato notes, which is odd because you think about an upright, generally an upright bass plays long notes when it's walking, you know, and that sustain and that woodiness and the bloom or blossom of the note is very cool. So I was just blowing through a little B flat blues there. So we'll do this in the key of B flat. Let's get away from C. All right, so check it out. So if I'm playing, walking line I, I, i'm set the camera up so you can really see my plucking hand clearly here right so if you check this out listen to this difference in sound if i go like this one two one two three four okay so that sounds good it's a more sort of jaco -y kind of way to approach it i'm playing right on the back pickup and i've got most of my tone pots you can see that there there you go so check it out. I'll try not to blind you with a light reflection. So uh, the treble pickup, back pickup is on almost full, but just dial back a bit. And I got a little bit, maybe like 10 or 15% of the front pickup in, but not a lot of tone, maybe like 10 or 15% of the tone control opened up. The bass I'm using today is a Moulin one. And this is one that it's passive, right? It's, it's an older body with a nitro finish. You know, it's very simple, very basic, very similar to my 65 Jazz, although it's got a little more low end. I think the pickups have a bit more beef to them. Um, now, that's one way to approach this, right? So you get a nice sound out of it still. I mean, Jazz bass is always sound great for this, but it's a little less warm than I might like if I was playing in a piano trio, right? So for example, listen to the difference if I go one, two, three, and... Now, if you, I'm also putting these skips in. I'm doing this, I'm overdoing this, but when you hear those skips, they're a nice feature, but not when they're done too much. So that's the other thing. Be aware of how intrusive that can be. However, check this out. A one, a two, a one, two, three, and... So, played a couple of choruses there, which I also recommend you transcribe. Write those out, figure those out, because I was really spelling out the changes for a classic kind of jazz blues on that with a couple of little variations for you. Now, what I did, as I'm sure you saw, was I started playing, instead of here, much more close or over the fingerboard, just like an upright player. Think about an upright player. Usually they're resting their thumb on the edge of the fingerboard. Obviously, they're playing this way around, but they're plucking here, right? Now, I didn't change. You could see this video is all straight through. I'm not one of those guys that shoots like 20 seconds and then has to edit it most of the time. Right? I like to shoot stuff as much as I can straight through so it's kind of real. I hate that thing where you feel somebody can't really execute anything without like putting it together in 10 second things. Or worse, they mime on video and they're like miming along to something they recorded earlier. So I like to keep this as honest and real as possible because that's kind of the point of jazz, really. So... What I was doing was, I just moved my hand to here. To there, and you could hear this massive difference in sound. There's this beautiful bloom to the note now. And you imagine that playing with a piano, an acoustic piano it blends really well. It's less intrusive, you know. One of the things I used to play a lot with a couple of very uh, talented piano players, especially when I lived back in England, um, one of whom had worked with Van Morrison and different things, which was very, you know, like kind of different to the sort of fusion and progressive rock and some of the stuff I got known for doing. And 
he said to me after one gig, he goes, man, you sound like an acoustic bass. How do you get that sound out of the electric? And, and it occurred to me that, you know, this is something that piano players would really love and not necessarily expect to hear from an electric player. So hand placement, right? Plucking hand placement, all right? Really important. I didn't change the pickup setting. Now, that's also useful. Imagine if you're doing a gig. Here's a really good practical example. Let's say you're trading fours. Trading fours is like trading four bar sections of a tune with another musician. And sometimes the bass player will jump in in the mix on this too. So if you're playing on a blues, you might take the first four bars or whatever it is, and the cycle is your turn. But in between that, unless you're obviously trading with the drums as well, in which case you normally let the drums play by themselves, you're playing walking bass or a bass line under the other soloist. See what I mean? I went right from playing like that, which is like, you know, perfect sound for blowing, nice lot of punch to it, clarity, but not too tinny. And then I can go to, to that straight away, you see. This is like gold. So really I would ex sort of encourage you to experiment with that, right? Because, like I said, you need to fuss around with the controls in the middle of the tune. And that kind of also, as a side note, I would notice sometimes when guys would constantly fiddle with their tone settings, it, it distracts other members of the band, you know? So if you settle on a tone that works, but then use your hand position, wow, it's really a huge moment, all right? Plus, your fretting hand, and obviously this applies to fretless, I mean, too, per se, also can play a part in your sound. You think about if you pluck every note and you're articulating here in the same way, it gives you a certain thing. But sometimes what I'll do, not always, but check, check this out. Notice how that first, eh? I'm coming down through a C minor here. So this, this is over this chord. To a B7, like that. This is really a two five, like that. A one, two, three, four, like the last, you know, couple of bars of the blues, for example. So I'm also using this hand to alter sound tone, right? So hand position and also like articulation, massive. Now, something else I tend to do on upright. A lot of the time I'll, um, I'll nag my students to alternate fingers, plucking fingers, right? On the plucking out, obviously. But sometimes, and, and I might've done it then, it's a subconscious thing, but I'll play some notes with one finger and it may often be the middle, you know, my... Like that, and I'll play a few in, the, in a row with the same finger. I think it's to approximate that thing where upright players often play with one finger. Some of those support a plucking finger, which is often the first index, with the second like this. You might see upright guys doing that. I'm just going to ch check in the monitor. Yeah, you can see that fine. Okay. So you see what I mean? So you'll, you'll notice that with some guys where they do that. Now, you can alternate strictly as well, but sometimes I'll do that. Let's also look at a really good tip for how you play lines through something like a blues. So it's part two. So the idea with this is, you know, I've talked about this before and I talk about this a lot to my students. When you're learning walking bass, I'm not a huge fan of the, this sort of overly simplistic explanation of just play arpeggios through the changes to begin with. And I think I mentioned this in the part one of the walking bass thing. The problem with that is you start playing arpeggios through something, you sort of crowbar this root third five seven if you play them in root position, and then you drop back down to the next root. Listen, so if you do that, you go one, two, three, four, root third five seven, root third five seven, third five seven, root. That just sounds bad. And it doesn't, it's not a line, it's just an arpeggio. That's all it is. And it doesn't connect. You go like this. See, it doesn't really connect. That, B flat seven arpeggio. The last note, the fourth note I played was an A flat. And I dropped down a fourth to the E flat, the root of the four chord, typically on bar two. That's not a very nice resolution. So 
you really want to create a line that connects into that. Check it out. So if I want to get from B flat to E flat, I'll probably play more of a stepwise movement. Here's a couple of classic ones. First one going up and then one coming down using two different things. So one, two, a one, two, three, four. All right, very simple. Root, root, second, third. And then that fourth is actually the root of the E flat. I don't love that though. This is better, check it out. Same principle getting from the B flat to the E flat, the one to the four. So you can learn to transpose this in different keys. One, two, a one, two, three, and. See, now I went root, second, sharp second or nine, major third, into the E flat, right? Much more musical. He's got a little tension in there, right? But it works beautifully. Okay, that's one way. You could also fingering wise, you need to do this. Look, a one, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four. Why I like that is then I can play another line ascending back up into the B flat with very simple fingering. Look, one, two, three, four, B flat, E flat. B flat. Those are the roots of the chords I navigated. One, two, three, four. See what I mean? That works really great. So I'm just going from a B flat seven to an E flat seven and back to a B flat, right? So all I'm doing, okay? Now, the line, what did it do? It ascended. It didn't go like this. This is another option, but I don't love this so much. One, two, three, four. It's not bad, but you see the line goes up and then down, one bar of each. It's okay, because there's some chromatic tension in that, which makes it work. But the other line continued ascending. So you have this, not like a sine wave thing, but you have this continual ascending graph thing like that. I like that, listen, one, two, three, and. See, that went all the way up to a high F here in the same direction. It's kind of nice, right? So instead of having that crowbar thing, up, down, up, down, or just up, down to the next up as you up, it had this sense of this really strong forward motion. This is a phrase you're gonna hear people use, it's forward motion, right? So this gives it like a real momentum. Uh, walking lines at their best have momentum, forward motion, you know? So that thing of a direction of line. now. We don't even need to do the whole blues to look at this, but that's why I strongly recommend like practicing this over a form and the 12 bar blues is like perfect for it, you know? Jazz blues, I'll stick one up probably up in the here behind me or there or somewhere on the screen or down, down like kind of here somewhere so you can see it. But uh, you, should, you should learn this and learn it in all keys. I would recommend learning the blues in C, F, B flat, E flat, and A flat, five of the keys starting with C and then work through the flats as a minimum, right? You'll find Charlie Parker blues like Billy's Bounce, you know, right? That was in F typically. in F. So that's a really good one to learn. So that comes to my last point on this. Nothing to do with walking bass, but a little tip that, that is essential. Goal, again, learn melodies, all right? Learn the heads to at least three, four, minimum. Jazz, blues, you can learn so much about melodic content to lines, you know. The genius of Charlie Parker and that opening line on Billy's Mouse, that funky, super greasy when he slides up like this, this, that, ah, he's going from the sharp nine or minor third, but it's sharp nine technically, up into the major third of this F7. It's like, oh my God, it's so hip, right? Another one would be Straight No Chaser, Thelonious Monk. I think that was originally in B flat, but in F it would be, I mean, listen to that. That's so funky. Now, obviously that scanning, 
that that note, the A flat, is actually the flat seven of the four chord B flat if we're playing an F. But it's also the ear tends to hear it still as being around that F tonality, so it has that sharp nine or flat third blue note flavor, doesn't it? <laughs> Right? So it's really funky. So that's a great tune and very clever rhythmically too, the way the melody kind of turns over itself. You check that out. That Straight No Chaser, Thelonious Monk, Billy's Bounce, Charlie Parker. Now's the time, real simple Charlie Parker one. But it's just cool on that little bit. That's outlining when it goes to bars five and six, when it goes to the four chord, and then the sharp four diminished. That's so cool, and Parker just does that with the notes F to B flat and F to B natural. You're gonna see how simple sometimes these things are, but how they outline the changes, which can also inform your walking lines and soloing, right? Uh, another killer blues. Uh, Does anyone recognize that? Tell me if you recognize that. I'm not even going to tell you. Let's see if you can recognize I'll give you a clue. It's written by a great saxophone player called Joe Henderson. And the turnaround was something of a sort of new development in, in the blues. You didn't see this sequence so much. The turnaround is originally, I think, in C, this one goes C7, then down a minor third to A7, then G flat seven, and then flat seven then back to see like through a diminished cycle right minor thirds down it's very cool so uh, joe henderson blues billy's band straight no chaser now's the time tenor madness is great by sonny rollins you know it's super cool it has a great two five lick in it so if you were playing this in b flat which i think was the original key uh but the turnaround lick on the two five one on the last four bars again so many great things to get out of these melodies you know um i wrote a blues um which uh is on my site too on my website if you're interested it's blues blues etude uh And then there's a whole three choruses of solo, and I write out the whole solo in tab and notation. And then there's a PDF, a little mini book explanation of it. So if you haven't got it, please support the channel and go go purchase it. It's like ten bucks or something. It's chock full of stuff. So let's recap. First of all, hand position, pluck in hand position. Think about experimenting between using more of the back pickup, that sound, and then. and then playing over the fingerboard, right? Really exaggerating that to begin with, right? Long notes, legato, yeah? Secondly, that thing of being able to move between the back pickup, perhaps when you're playing a melody or blowing over the changes, and then walking, moving back to more of that upright vibe sound by playing closer to the fingerboard, right? Pickup selection is not as critical as hand placement in this, all right? That's the cool thing about it. You don't have to worry about fiddling around with the controls and going back and forth. Once you've got it set up to a nice sound, you're dialed because you're just using the hand position, right? Then the other thing was fretting hand ideas, right? Experiment with legato playing on this hand. What I was saying to you earlier about that thing about being able to do stuff in real time, not practicing it, and then kind of putting up 20 seconds of a YouTube thing and then waiting till you get your next best take. Notice what I did there. I just played that line for you. I hadn't practiced that before the video. And I'm playing it consistently, right? That's the thing. So when you come up with something which is a cool kind of sounding line with maybe this legato thing, oh man, okay, so. <laughs> Notice how it's pretty consistent doing that, right? I was moving it down whole steps. I was thinking B flat, right? A flat, right? right? So the thing is, it's real. This is honest stuff, right? Throw yourself into it, you know? Find out how good you are. Like, Can I play this? Like, yeah. Right? 
Notice I'm putting a little push on that. Right? And again, what I want is a little attack sometimes. So that first note. One, two, one, two, three. See? So I'm turning it now into music, all right? So that's the other thing. It's like when you're practicing this stuff, turn it into music, you know? No practice isn't the gig. But what you're doing is making the practice musical practice. So you'll enjoy doing it, all right? And you'll also start to build up ideas that you can draw upon when you're actually playing, you know? And that's really important too. Okay, so there's a ton of stuff in this video. Hopefully you dug it. Uh, don't forget to support the channel, please. Um, like, subscribe. Uh, if you want to pick up something from my website, there's a ton of stuff to download. I, that blues etude is really killer if you don't have it. I, I really think you'll get a lot out of that. Um, you can also do a buy me a coffee donation, which is in the description below, um, which is always great. You can either kind of become a regular supporter on that with a subscription, or you can just do a one-off thing. And all of this is great. It really helps me you know, do these videos and supports the channel, which is awesome. And I'll see you on the next one. All right, thanks. Bye.